really, really thank you all for being here. We know you could have been anywhere and you could see what else. So we appreciate you for joining the first session, which uh, took a little bit of time to get started, but we do appreciate your patience. Yet we were able to finish on time. So congratulations to the facilitators and everybody involved in that process. And uh, during the break, we know there were some issues with sound, yet we do appreciate you, Bill, for uh, presenting the video. At least folks know about the video and on their own time, they can check the video out, show some support and some love. Uh, this session here, also one, one thing we want to thank Fernando and Yamil, our special guests, our brothers from Cuba. We appreciate you all. Uh, Fernando for his message, and then Yamil also for joining us. Uh, and also talk a little bit about our, our uh, co-chair meeting we had uh, last week. We appreciate that. Uh, we do want to welcome our new co-chairs, Shaquille and, and Kaya. And then also, we want to congratulate Cheryl and John for their re-election. We want to thank Dolomar and the People's Church again. And uh, once again, you all, I am Mamadou, one of the co-chairs here. So we're going to get started uh, by opening up with some, uh, some words from Ambassador Yuri Gano. Uh So without further ado, uh, Yuri, are you ready? Yes. Ambassador Gala is ready. Ambassador Gala is ready. Well, good afternoon. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Do you hear me well? Yes. Online? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Well, let me start by uh, obviously uh, thanking you all for being here. Um, most importantly, for inviting us to share um, some of the time that you're devoting to this meeting with me, the two officials from the Q1 mission, Ivan and Joangel. And for us, it's always uh, a real pleasure uh, to be with you here to share some information and to obviously engage in a, in a fruitful discussion uh, about issues which are uh, very important, not only for Cuba, for you, but to many people in the world as well. And I understand that uh, this part of the, of the meeting, um, during this part of the meeting, you, you are going to discuss uh, specifically the unjust inclusion of Cuba in the so-called list of uh, state sponsoring terrorism. And that is an important issue, it's uh, an issue that uh, for us uh, should be addressed or rather analyzed, uh, taking into account a variety of angles. And I think that, um, I don't know how much time uh, do I have to, to, to address this, but perhaps I could start by making an initial statement and then um, we'll be ready to, to engage in a discussion uh, on this topic. But quickly, let me start by referring to the historic um, dynamics of this um, inclusion of Cuba in the, in the mentioned list. Obviously, this is not the first time that Cuba is on that list. As you all know, Cuba was initially included in that list back in uh, 1982 um, under untenable pretext uh, and without presenting the slightest evidence of participation or linkage in any uh, terrorist actions or plans or anything related to that. Uh, that was obviously at the time, we're talking about the 80s, there was at the time um, a political manipulation, a political move, uh, which was not in any way um, sustained or um, based on international law. Nonetheless, Cuba was included, uh, and on that list, some other countries were also mentioned that. The, the idea um, behind the inclusion of Cuba was actually to try to uh, strengthen the effectiveness of the blockade against Cuba. Because the, and I will talk about that later, but in, in the case of Cuba, once uh, we were on the, the, uh, the, the blockade, the uh, coercive measures related to the blockade, 
uh, then with the inclusion in that on that list, the uh, impact will be uh, more severe on our economy because of the ramifications and implications that uh, any state included on that list would, would suffer. Uh, and, and we're talking about um, implications in terms of restrictions on exports, trade, development, aid, credits, and others. So that was 1982. Uh, we, were, uh, it, we were on that list for about 30 years. And in 2015, basically in May, we were removed from that list. And that was the context in which the Cuban government and the United States government engaged in diplomatic discussions, uh, whereby in July of that year, uh, both countries were able to establish diplomatic relations. As part of those discussions in May, uh, the U.S. government took the decision or the step to, uh, to remove Cuba from, from the sponsor, uh, state sponsoring uh, terrorism. The uh, exclusion, um, at the time we mentioned that um, even though obviously um, it was uh, a good, a positive step to remove Cuba, but we nonetheless reiterated that Cuba should never be on that list. So it was not right. something that uh, <coughs> was just a positive step. It was actually uh, a, a rectification or a remedy uh, to, to, to a very negative step that was taken, an unjust step that was taken back in the 80s. The other thing that happened in terms of the historic uh, dynamics of this is that after the Obama administration, the Trump administration, as you all know, changed the policy uh, towards Cuba. And in May 2020, the Trump administration took the step to include Cuba in a related list, not on the mentioned, uh, previously mentioned list, but on, on a list that is basically, again, from the State Department, but a list of countries that do not fully cooperate in the fight against terrorism. So this is a, 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 another um, document, another list, that basically we're saying that Cuba was not fully cooperating to, uh, with the United States in the fight against terrorism. And in January 2021, days before the, uh, the end of the Trump administration, they took the decision to re-include Cuba unjustly in the uh, State uh, Department's list uh, of, of countries sponsoring terrorism. So that was basically uh, the evolution of that uh, in terms of the, uh, of the dates, in terms of the sequence. Now, I think it's important to analyze, first of all, the nature of those lists that the State Department actually draft and, 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 and publish. The first, the first thing to understand is that since the 80s of, of um, of the last century, the, the United States has been uh, using that, that, uh, those lists as, a, as an instrument of their foreign policy, basically uh, with a number of purposes. But those lists were actually an attempt to qualify or to classify countries uh, depending on the nature of the specific list. Because uh, there is a list related to um, state sponsoring terrorism. There is a list related to uh, religious intolerance or religious freedom. There is a list on human rights. So there are a number of lists. Um, in all of those cases, we're talking about a list that is drafted by a specific country, not by the United Nations. So it's a unilateral list. Uh, the impossibility of imposing its agenda and criteria against the will of, of the majority of states has led, since the 80s, uh, has led the United States uh, government for years to publish um, on different topics, as I explained, 
uh, those leads to actually put a finger or to uh, point the finger at other nations as well. In the case of the specific list that we're discussing today, uh, we think that uh, there are ample evidence that that move was unjustified, is um, something not actually uh, sustained on, on facts, and is easily questionable, but unfortunately has remained part of the tools of foreign policy against Cuba. Uh, it is also important to recognize that uh, those leads uh, are actually uh, a, legit a legitimate uh, attempt to, to put Cuba on the spot on an issue which is very sensitive, not only for the U.S. population, but to the world itself, and obviously to Cuba as well. Um, it seeks to discredit Cuba and put pressure on third countries in their relations uh, with our, our nation. Now, the second point would be the implications of being on any of those lists, which is important as well. So it's not only the nature, as I mentioned before, which is a unilateral list, is not a list that has been negotiated or drafted or endorsed at the United Nations or at any international forum whereby member states can actually identify those countries. So that's not the idea. This is something that is a unilateral exercise by the United States. Now, the implications of that, I think we have to, to, to analyze this. Uh, I think it's important uh, to understand that for any country, uh, not only Cuba, but for any country, being on any of those lists has consequences, and specifically on, on the list of uh, state sponsoring terrorism, has consequences related to the restriction of exports, elimination of certain commercial benefits, and access to credits in international financial institutions, as well as the prohibition of arms exports and limitations on the uh, granting of economic aid. So that's the um, general approach in terms of the implications. In the case of Cuba, the, the inclusion of, of, of our country on, on, on the set list is part of the U.S. strategy to isolate Cuba and uh, provoke uh, economic collapse. So it's basically a tool to reinforce the uh, blockade as well. Now, in practical terms, what are the implications for Cuba, specifically speaking? First, financial persecution uh, uh, to anything related to Cuba. So for the banking system worldwide, this is something that will trigger automatically uh, a concern uh, whenever a, uh, to any transaction related to Cuba. So there is a financial persecution uh, because of that as well. Which, by the way, it was already because to understand better this issue, I think it's important to, to know to note that Cuba is basically under the impact of two uh, very powerful tools of the U.S. foreign policy, which is whatever sanctions, uh, regimes, or scheme that you are under, in the case of Cuba, well, uh, we all know that we are under the blockade for six decades, but at the same time, we have been under the impact of this list, which has also the consequences. And I explain this because, for example, uh, we've been told that if by any reasons, uh, the blockade is lifted tomorrow, but you are still on the list of state sponsoring terrorism, you will be subject still <coughs> to many restrictions in trade, commercial, aid, access to financial credits, etc. And vice versa. So you might be excluded from the list of state sponsoring terrorism, but if you are still under the embargo, which is the case of Cuba, 
uh, during the Obama, the last two years of the Obama administration, you're still subject to many restrictions. So they complement each other, uh, and really you have to get rid of, the, of both if you have to, if, if you want to have a normal relationship. Secondly, the inclusion on the list exponentially increases the so-called country risk and forces Cuba to pay for any merchandise at double the price on international markets. It will also, it is important also to, 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 to highlight that they, at the international level, it causes difficulties for Cuba in its relationship with financial institutions, with banks, including governments, uh, governmental banking and commercial institutions of countries with which Cuba has good relations. Due to the threat posed by the United States against anyone who is related to a country that is supposedly uh, a sponsor of terrorism. Now, there is also an implication which is in the realm of uh, the judiciary or legal proceedings, which is that once you are on that list, <coughs> it opens up the possibility for US entities to start legal proceedings against Cuba under US anti-terrorism laws. And as a matter of fact, due to the previous inclusion of Cuba in, in, on that list, a number of lawsuits were presented against Cuba based on the uh, presence of Cuba on that list. So it triggers that additional implication uh, with lawsuits, um, and obviously it, it also has economic implications uh, for the Cuban economy as well. So in other words, it is not, not only uh, something that is absurd, it is immoral, uh, but also is really causing a tremendous impact in our economy as we speak. Another angle of this issue uh, is basically what is the record of Cuba when it comes to fighting terrorism. And I think that uh, it brings me to the idea that the U.S. government has been unable to show any credible evidence whatsoever to justify the inclusion of Cuba in this unilateral list. So that is something that I want to um, emphasize. This designation by the U.S. administration uh, for us constitutes an action without any basis, authority, or international backing whatsoever. Uh, and Cuba, to speak about the the record of Cuba, we have to look first of all our, to our constitution. And Cuba endorses in our uh, current constitution the rejection, repudiation, and condemnation of terrorism in any of its forms and manifestations. That is included in our constitution. And I think that it is important to, to highlight this uh, to understand what is the record of Cuba when it comes to that. But I think there is a position that Cuba has defended for many years, not only domestically, but at the international forum. And I will uh, read it because it is a comprehensive position and the one that we will continue to be uh, highlighting in, in those four. Cuba holds a long-standing position of firm rejection and condemnation of all acts, methods, and practices of terrorism in all its forms and manifestations by whomever, against whomever, and wherever they are committed, whatever their motivations, including those in which states are involved, directly or indirectly. So that's our position. Um, in the United Nations, the issue of uh, terrorism, the fight against terrorism, has been very present 
Um, there has been an intense debate over the years, even in the definition of terrorism. I won't enter into this, but just to uh, you know, mention that this is an issue which is very uh, difficult in, in the discussions at the United Nations because the definition of terrorism has many, many angles as well. There are a number of countries uh, who support an idea of what terrorism is, leaving aside some other important issues that should be in that definition. But that's another discussion. And, and I think that Cuba has a totally clean record in the fight against terrorism. We have never participated in the organization, financing, or execution of terrorist acts against any country in the world, including the United States. We have never allowed, and we will never allow, our territory uh, to be used against uh, to commit acts of terrorism against other countries in the world. That has been our very clear, crystal clear position. So, and I reiterate that uh, for the record as well. And in terms of international commitment uh, by Cuba, it has to be said that Cuba was the fifth country in the world to become a state party to the 19 international conventions on terrorism. Uh, and in, even recently, uh, we raised uh, recently that to the constitutional right uh, in, in our current constitution. So that is something that uh, we have to bear in mind when analyzing what Cuba has done on that field. Our country has carried out in some bilateral cooperation uh, actions with the United States government in the fight against terrorism. It has to be said that as well. Uh, during the last two years of the Obama administration, we were able to negotiate and sign a number of uh, memorandum of understandings uh, related to law enforcement, including the fight against terrorism. So that was done. Uh, those agreements or memorandums, my understanding, is that they are still in effect. I don't know in terms of implementation, but that shows uh, the willingness that the Cuban government has had over the years to cooperate uh, in a meaningful manner uh, with the United States government in the fight against uh, terrorism. The other angle of this issue is the what Cuba has been over the years, which is Cuba has been a victim of terrorism. So we have been uh, unjustly accused of being a sponsor of terrorism, but the reality is that Cuba has been a victim of terrorist actions for many years. And I'm sure you have plenty of information on that, but let me just recap a little bit. So since the uh, triumph of the Cuban Revolution, uh, many, many actions uh, have been taken against Cuba, uh, including violent actions, to try to uh, destroy the Cuban Revolution. Uh, Cuba has been a victim of terrorism, and we're still suffering from the instigation of violence and terrorist acts from the United States territory. So for more than 60 years, the Cuban people have been, um, as I mentioned, victim of many terrorist actions, and as a consequence of that, we have uh, a humanitarian toll, or, or a human toll uh, on that, that is uh, very sensitive for us, but I think should be, um, you know, remembered. So far we have lost more than 3,000 persons in Cuba because of terrorist acts, while more than 2,000 have been maimed because of terrorist acts. So that's the, the, you know, the, the implication of those uh, terrorist actions over the years. And obviously, that has caused tremendous suffering and, and damage um, to the Cuban population as a whole. It has had uh, economic impact, but I think the most important thing here is the human toll of those terrorist actions. Um, the variety, the, there is a variety of, uh, 
you know, actions taking, uh, terrorist actions taken against Cuba. Um, we have, for example, uh, the destruction of civilian and economic targets uh, in our country, pirate attacks uh, against um, merchant ships, uh, fishing boats, kidnappings, explosions, you name it. So there is a variety of, of, of uh, terrorist actions there. But it, it is not only, we're not only talking about actions carried out in the Cuban territory, but also elsewhere. And that brings me to the diplomatic missions of Cuba uh, in, in countries in the world, including in the United States. Here in, in New York, we will always remember one of the diplomats that was killed um, some years ago, as you know. But it, it is not only that example. There are other examples in terms of ex explosives uh, putting on diplomatic missions. And we're not talking about things that happened decades ago. And that, and that is important because on 20, in 2020, we had um, another incident which was very important to highlight then and now, which is that an individual um, went to Washington, D.C. and opened fire to our <laughs> embassy in the, in the D.C. Uh, fortunately, there were no human casualties, but it was a very, very dangerous incident. Um, we obviously um, classified that as a terrorist action, uh, and we, we think it is a very present evidence that the, there is a danger that is still uh, present there. The other thing that I wanted to mention is the international reputation of this. Well, we have been claiming, we have been um, denouncing, obviously, the, the unjust inclusion of Cuba in the mentioned list. And I think that we have garnered a lot of support, internationally speaking, uh, from many countries in the world, specifically individuals, NGOs, uh, solidarity groups. Uh, and I think that there are a number of governments all over the world who have also come forward in supporting the claim by Cuba. And I think that a recent example of that is what happened in the recent high-level segment of the General Assembly of the United Nations, where a number of countries or delegations uh, not only included a mention to the need to get rid of the blockade, but also they mentioned that it was also important to remove Cuba from the state sponsoring uh, terrorism list. So that is something that proves that we have also uh, we have been receiving that kind of support at the government level uh, from certain countries. Uh, even the United Nations Secretary, and specifically the spokesperson of the Secretary General, back in, in 2021 mentioned that Cuba should be excluded from that list. That was at the beginning of, of the uh, year 2021. And Cuba, and the delegations of Cuba, we will continue uh, denouncing this in any multilateral fora in which we are uh, present. The, the other thing, just to uh, conclude in my initial statement here, is that we just knew, and I'm sure you have seen that letter, but in any case, it should be highlighted that um, some days ago or weeks ago, a number of former leaders from Latin America and the Caribbean uh, signed a letter in which they asked President Biden not only to uh, eliminate the blockade, but also to remove Cuba <coughs> from the set list. We know that few politicians in the United States truly believe <coughs> that Cuba should be on that list. Uh, I would say that the majority uh, of persons who are related to this issue, they do understand that this is a political move that uh, should be rectified. And we hope that this can be done uh, sooner rather than later. Um, we have to remember that the re-inclusion of that 
of Cuba on that list was actually done uh, when the Trump administration was about to be ended, only nine days or eight days to, to finalize the tenure, um, Cuba was re-included on, on the set list. The current U.S. president could correct it with just one signature, because there is an established procedure, which is an executive decision to do that, if there is a will to do that. And that would be morally correct and in accordance with uh, the law as well. So to finalize my initial um, statement here, I would also uh, reaffirm that terrorism cannot be eradicated if double standards, manipulation, political opportunism, and selectivity in dealing with it prevail. So we have to have a consistent approach when it comes to fight uh, uh, to, to, uh, to fight in terrorism. There shouldn't be any double standards. You have to be very transparent, straightforward when, when dealing with this scourge. And it is unacceptable that some terrorist acts are condemned while others are silenced, tolerated, encouraged, justified, or manipulated for political or economic interest. And with that, I thank you. On behalf of the people of we would all like to thank you, Ambassador Yuri Gallo. We appreciate you taking the time to come and be a part of our meeting. It's always important to hear from the students. Uh, so we truly appreciate you coming and, and giving us the information you gave us. And once again, taking the time uh, to, to spend with us and educate us about what's going on. Uh, we were going to show two videos. Um, yet, obviously, due to the technical realities that we're dealing with, we're not going to be able to show those, but I wanted to announce those videos so you at your own leisure can take some time to watch these videos if you have not already watched them. One is called U.S. Regulation Punishes Cuba. Uh, the other one is The War in Cuba, Episode 5. Both of these videos are a uh, belly of the beast production video. So one is only five minutes, the other one's a little bit longer, but we do recommend that you watch these videos if you have not already watched them. And remember, you know, these, these videos, they're on YouTube when you're doing different events. Uh, you can utilize this information to help educate the folks that you are uh, bringing to, to various meetings and workshops. So. Robert, could you name the, could you name the, 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 the films again? I'll name them for everybody except for Nesbitt. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You play the chat. When somebody put it in the chat. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll list them off again, and then if somebody can put them in the chat while I'm speaking, I appreciate it. So that's U.S. Regulation Punishes Cuba. The other one is The War in Cuba, Episode 5. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to go off. Go off a little bit, you all, so bear with us. Uh, I wanted to make sure that I took some time to acknowledge Sharon, Sharon Robo. One of our, um, one of our co-chairs, she's not going to rerun again uh, for, for various reasons that we definitely respect it, but I wanted to make sure that I acknowledge the work that she's done over the last two years. Um, you all, I've been in meetings with this Sharon almost every other Tuesday and sometimes every Tuesday, Thursday, whatever has to happen. And Sharon is extremely detailed and note-taking. We truly appreciate that. Keeping us uh, aware of certain things that we need to be aware of when having meetings and making decisions and planning. So a lot of those meetings, people never hear about them because, you know, folks aren't there. Yet as someone who's been there, uh, I, I know that the rest of the co-chair has meant what I'm saying. We always uh, lifted up in those meetings, so we wanted to lift it up in front of everybody here as a part of this meeting. Sharon, uh, we appreciate you. Uh, we look forward, and I'm putting this out there, we look, we look forward to seeing you wear your co-chair hat later in the future. <laughs> so much respect, much again, Sharon. Um, so now we're going to get started uh, with the next discussion for this session here at our meeting. Uh, and it's going to be around strategizing how to get Cuba off the state sponsors of terrorism list. We're going to hear from three different presenters. They're representing three different organizations. 
So please uh, pay attention, and if you can, take notes. Uh, the first person we're going to hear from is Natasha Bannon, a representative of Terry. Uh, Natasha, are you ready? Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Thank Great, you. thank you. So I'll, I'll just say, um, I apologize in advance of my connection. Well, one, for keeping my camera off, and if my connection is a little um, iffy, I'm, like others, I'm in Cuba, and so the connection goes in and out. So I apologize for that, and you may also hear um, my baby crying in the background. So I just want to give you a heads up on that as well. Um, for those who are unfamiliar with Hathere, I just wanted to give a brief intro and to encourage every organization to join us. That stands for the Alliance for Cuba Engagement and Respect. And for anyone who's been to Cuba, you know that I said it's a very common word that's used. And it's, in essence, it's really a, a coalition and alliance that's designed to kind of channel grassroots activism and voices into concrete progressive policies from Washington. So our focus really is Washington and policy arena, um, and we hope to be able to lift up a lot of the great work that's been going on, but really help translate that into pressure, political pressure in D.C. And I know that the legislative and executive arena hasn't always been at the forefront of much of our activism and grassroots work and solidarity work. And I just want to take a moment to encourage us to kind of rethink that. There's one thing that I've learned over the years and leading delegations and doing Cuba solidarity work is that I have been asked over and over by Cuban colleagues to um, focus on DC, that, you know, that's the fact that we're in a position to do that when they're not. Um, and that's where the ultimate changes are going to occur. I hope that we're able, as an advocacy community, to be able to recenter the significance of what it, the really work in the policy arena. And so I, I just want to mention a few things. And, and I, the first, there are several folks who are on the in this meeting who are on us at an advisory committee. And so I just want to appreciate their presence and work that they've been doing um, with us today. We always want to be able to work very closely with the different solidarity spaces. Um, just kind of a brief, I thought I would give a very brief election recap from our perspective and then to specifically the state sponsored terrorism campaign work that we've been doing. The ambassador laid out the full scenario and case the significance of this designation and the impact on Cuba's um, economy and, and, and civil life mm -hmm. and the pressure that has been mounting to um, ask Biden to reverse Trump policies and they're really Trump-Biden policies at this point because he's adopted nearly all of Trump sanctions and policies that were left for him, with the exception of very few um, minor adjustments that he's been making. Um, you know, even though all of the election results aren't in, we have a general sense that, which we kind of knew before, that the House would probably be going Republican, the Senate, like it may stay the same, and that affects our strategy, which has been focused on building congressional awareness and pressure, for especially among Democrats, to pressure their own party leader, which is the president, to um, adjust policy overall of Cuba, and increasingly around the state-sponsored terrorism delegation. So some of you may recall the uh, pain that I said it took a lead role in around this time last year in getting an unprecedented 114 members of Congress to send a letter to President Biden asking for very specific changes to our policy and that included the state sponsored terrorism letter which we 
that the majority of the Democratic caucus supports removal of puke from this list. Uh, a separate letter was also sent by six senators who subsequently met with President Biden, as well as the House leaders who authored, who folded the letter on the House side, um, also met with the President. And in those conversations, removal from this list was specifically mentioned. Um, so it's been bumped up as a priority. However, in conversations and meetings with State Department representatives who work on Cuba policy, um, these meetings are before the election. What has been shared with us is that removal from the list is not a priority at that time. Um, we do have reason to believe, as has been kind of iterated in very um, spaces and meetings, that that may shift now post election, that post election there would be more, and quite honestly, political will to remove Cuba from the list. We all know that Cuba policy is not really considered foreign policy work, it's really domestic electoral policy strategy as to how it's treated and really reduced to kind of Florida electoral strategy. In addition to considerations for other, um, how to appease other members of Congress, specifically Senator for Menendez. Um, and so the state sponsor terrorism list, removal list, actually is part of a campaign mm -hmm. that has been um, kind of co created between a Senate and Code Pink that includes building international pressure. <coughs> Then just as a reminder, the two kind of remaining justifications for having Cuba on the list were that, that Pompeo um, put in his letter uh, to Congress was that Cuba had um, supported or you know, was, was, was um, providing aid in, in essence to terrorists, i.e. kind of guerrilla groups from Colombia, and this was part of Cuba's role facilitating peace dialogue and discussion, particularly with the ELN, the Ejército de Liberación Nacional in Colombia. The new Colombian president, however, has specifically asked Cuba to resume their role as a guarantor of those peace discussions and has asked President Biden to remove Cuba from the list of state sponsors of terrorism. So that justification no longer, or purported justification, is no longer legitimate. The other one is around Cuba's supposed harboring of fugitives, which has been a reason given repeatedly over the years. However, we know that it wasn't a significant enough justification for the Obama administration to remove Cuba from the list. So it's already at some point in previous administrations been looked at and rejected as rationale and for meeting the legal standard around international terrorism to be to, to justify its inclusion on the list, which means that there really is no legal reasoning for Cuba to be on the list, and it kind of serves as political cover until we believe post elections when there's more political will to turn to this issue. Um, so the campaign includes some international targets and really getting leaders, international leaders of the state to be able to call on the president to remove you from the list. You, the ambassador mentioned the recent letter of 18 former heads of state that was sent to Biden um, asking for removal from the list. Biden is definitely the target, even though we are working with some congressional um, allies to continue to, to pressure the administration, possibly another dear colleague type letter. Some of you who have signed on to send his letters in the past or have gotten our emails are familiar with, with these dear colleague letters, which are letters that are led by members of Congress, circulated to their colleagues for sign-on and then sent to the administration. Um, with a possible Republican House, those letters aren't as effective, but 
they also serve to help educate members of Congress around Cuba policy. And to that extent, we want to encourage more of them. And that leads me to my next point, which is that what we're really hoping to do, and kind of stay tuned for this, is that we want to better engage with all of you in strengthening the grassroots advocacy focused on specific legislative targets and particularly executive targets. Biden is the ultimate target, and to that end, I said it is, has developed um, an online toolkit with sample letters and tweets and statements, and we'll be rolling out soon a digital campaign where folks can directly email and send letters um, to the administration. Um, we also recognize the need for an enhanced communications and media strategy to really focus on narrative <coughs> shifting. Um, so, and that includes amongst allies even, who have um, been re told repeatedly, particularly since last summer, a certain narrative about Cuba. And this is coming also from the Democrats, not just you know, you know, the Republicans, um, that has made it much harder to push for more substantive um, policy adjustments in the administration. In addition to the fact that there's an administration that is adopting earlier failed strategies um, around Cuba that hopefully after this election will reveal and current polling for more reveal is no longer an effective strategy. But the narrative shifting piece is really significant. Um, and we're, we're hoping that the campaign will, will include significant aspects of that to make it easier for when we do advocacy that we're not always on the defensive trying to respond to specific criticisms that we all have heard over and over and over again and have been debunked. But rather, in addition to our usual talking points, we also have other things that we can talk about as well, around, for example, the recent family quote that was passed. Um, so around the, the state sponsored terrorism campaign, I just want to mention, you know, the, the letter of the 18 former heads of state, 114 members of Congress, six senators. We've had letters that we have sent with over 100 organizations asking for Cuba's removal from the list. Over 10,000 people have signed a petition online. So there is significant pressure that has been building. Um, what we'll be rolling out soon, as I mentioned, is, is, is a more digital campaign and uh, teach-ins for those who feel that they need additional support in our solidarity space in reaching out to Congress, um, congressional call-ins and call-ins in the State Department, and um, really helping do the constituent outreach that we know is critical and needed, and not just with members of Congress, but with senators. They often are left out of our direct advocacy efforts and yet play a really critical role in, particularly in the vice and consent component when they're informed, when presumably when the administration informs them of their intent to remove Cuba from the list. We want to also, recognizing that there will be a more hostile Congress coming in, blunt any potential legislative fallout that could come when um, the six month kind of heads up is provided Congress. As we saw with the recent amendment vote a couple of months ago that Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib introduced, which was a really, really, really low level hanging fruit vote around allowing Cuba to purchase certain agricultural products and get credit for, uh, to allow them credit to be able to purchase that from U.S. farmers. And there was a huge, in the, on the day of the vote, a huge kind of on the floor lobbying effort led by Democrats, kind of centrist Democrats, and including the Florida delegation to oppose Cuba's ability to essentially access credit to purchase food for its population and support its farmers in the process of doing so. So we know that whenever, whenever Congress is 
there's a con congressional component to this. It's not just nullifying the GOP. It's also really trying to, to nullify and at least neutralize some of these centrists to write voice within the Democratic Party. Um, so gr the grassroots advocacy efforts and particularly constituent outreach is going to be a key focus of us that I will be working on and reaching out to all of you on um, in the coming one to two months or so. We hope to be able to really get most, much of this started before the incoming Congress uh, gets seated. So I will pause there for now. I want to thank you for wearing a mask for one coming to present to us today while at the same time caring for your days. We really appreciate that and respect that revolutionary salute. Uh, the political, cultural, and historical information and education was much needed. Uh, I see a few hands up and I ask you all to write your questions down because we're going to open the floor to discussion after the third person is presented. So we have two more presenters. Once that is done, uh, we will open the floor. So thank you all for your patience. Uh, thank you once again, Natasha. Our next presenter will be Rita Farouch, a uh, representative of the Revolution Committee. Uh, Rita, are you ready? Yes, I am. All right, you have the floor. Okay. Thank you so much. Greetings to everyone from Richmond, California, on the Lonely Land. Uh, maybe I should speak up. Um, well, it's wonderful to follow Natasha's uh, tremendously informative presentation. I get to speak with you on how we can uh, effectively add to this campaign by passing a new resolution focused on urging that Cuba be removed from the list. I want to make sure that everyone knows I think uh, many of you have been involved in passing resolutions in the past, and we thank you for that. I've been working with the Resolutions Committee um, throughout, uh, for some years now as part of the Saving Lives campaign. And um, we started the resolution right here in Richmond, and I want to say that it was an initial suggestion by Alicia Rafo of Blessed Memory, and um, we took it right to the City Council, and uh, it was sponsored by Eduardo Martinez, who I'm glad to tell you is, as we speak, um, winning the election for mayor of Richmond. So he will continue to be a strong ally with us. Uh, and was at our demonstration last week in, in San Francisco. Uh, so the resolution was developed and we were tremendously impressed to see that people across the country uh, were inspired to uh, propose it and pass it at their city councils, labor unions, and other organizations. So from that beginning of passing it in a few cities in San, San Francisco, Oakland, um, et cetera, it flew across the country, gaining steam everywhere, and um, many major cities passed it. I have uh, the list here in front of me of 64 municipalities and boards and state legislatures and then, um, labor unions that have passed it as of today. So, moving forward to the new resolution, we felt strongly, after hearing um, the ambassador from D.C. speak here in, um, in, the, in the East Bay, uh, it was, just as Ambassador uh, from the U.N. has said today, we know how tremendously important it is to get Cuba off of this list. And um, we felt that one of the ways that we can amplify and demonstrate the widespread support for doing that across the United States is to launch a new resolution. So that resolution has been finalized, and don't look now, but you all have it as a link. Um, when the meeting's over, just look at your most recent NNOC agenda uh, the email that came with, the, with today's agenda, actually the last two emails, have a link. You just go to this section in the agenda. There's a link to two documents. One of them is the new resolution, 
which I know you can't read, but this is what it looks like. Just straightforward text in as a Word document designed to be very easily adapted for your municipality. And, and by the way, I, I should say that um, the intention here is to engage every person who's on this call in initiating resolutions um, where you are or with your organization because it's very doable and it's very useful. So, two documents. One is this resolution. The other one is we put the resolution also in a flyer format so that it can also be used as uh, for organizing, educating, and we've actually changed the um, the picture, the one that you have the link to has a picture from the demonstration in San Francisco last week, but it's something like this. And so we want to encourage you to link to that and be thinking about where you might be able to propose the resolution. For any of you who have not done it yet, we intend to make it uh, very, very feasible for you. You are right now surrounded on, in cyberspace and in presence by people who have passed resolutions and people who know how to help you do it. Um, members of our committee are standing by to receive your email questions about this. Um, I want to be sure to just give you the very practical information about that. Uh, one of our members, Marcy Shapiro, is on the meeting and she has offered to use her email, which I'm going to give you in just a moment, so please get a pen. Um, her, her email will be the place to send questions or send your intention of where you would like to propose the resolution. Let us know. Uh, our committee helps with technical assistance, um, with encouragement. We actually had developed a brief guide on uh, passing successful resolutions. We have it in writing. We have it as a video. Um, we really want to make sure that everyone can succeed at this. I've gotten uh, many people have said that they they really enjoyed doing it and they were surprised by how much support they got. It provides a vehicle to educate your uh, elected officials on, uh, on Cuba and specifically on this issue. The resolution, basically the whereas clauses, to be honest with you, they summarize much of what's been said already today. Um, we made it as succinct as possible, but there's, there's a whereas about you know, how it is that Trump put Cuba back on the list without any justification, et cetera. So it serves as a talking points. It serves as a way to just introduce this and walk people through why it's so egregious and so important. And of course, it starts out by saying that President Biden has the authority to take Cuba off of this list by executive order. And that's super important, as you know. So I'm just trying to be really practical here with my few minutes. Oh, I want to give you the good news that the new resolution, you know, we just recently finalized it and started to make it available. And in Seattle, it has already been passed by the England Boatmen's Union of the Pacific, the ILWU. And just to show you, this is, this is it. So that's wonderful, that's a good start, and we'll be um, looking to introduce it uh, in some city councils in the Bay Area, and I really, um, I know I've heard from a couple of people that they intend to um, be doing that uh, where they're located. So what we're asking, oh, let me, sorry, I want to make sure I give you the email address. So we really mean it that the purpose of our committee is to help people succeed in passing these resolutions. That's why we wrote, you know, a straightforward guide, and it's also why um, we make ourselves available to by email or even by phone coach people on doing it. Um, and I'll, I'll just tell you one of the basic things is you find a supportive 
member of your city council or board of supervisors or union and you start there and meet with them and it grows from there. It's, it's, a, it's a very practical way to codify and amplify our voices and once we pass these resolutions in many municipalities, we can aggregate the number of people that that represents. We estimated that it was over 4 million people that were represented by the resolutions that had been passed some months ago. And that was when we had maybe 40 resolutions. And now I count 64. So um, it's considerably more than that. Um, and, you know, it's a great way, you can take that with you to your legislators. Um, it's a great way to demonstrate the support. So now let me give you Marcy Shapiro's, I'm sorry, Marcy Shapiro's email. I'm going to spell it. It's her name, but it's M A R C Y A S H A P I R O at gmail.com. Say it one more time. So it's Marcy A Shapiro at gmail.com, all lowercase. So please hold on to that and um, let us hear from you. See, bring it to your committees. Um, let us know if you need the steps on passing resolutions. And I'm trying to see if I covered everything. Um, now, well, I, I just want to say that, you know, sometimes it's easy to feel frustrated and impotent that we haven't seen more um, action from Washington yet um, in the ways that we know are so important. This resolution's work is concrete and it's something that you can do um, that is empowering and, um, and really, and really activates and animates your community. So um, I highly recommend it and basically we need everybody to do it. Um, if we have 65 now, 64 now, that's that's based on remove that's ending the blockade, and that was based on um, collaboration with um, medical facilities during COVID. So now we need another 64 resolutions at least focused on removing Cuba from this odious list. I can't even say the name of the list. It's bothers me to say. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. Thank you all so much. Uh, Rita, and to the resolution, uh, making the resolution so accessible and, and easy for folks to to complete in their in their areas. So thank you again, Rita, and the resolution committee. Uh, and now we're going to hear from Carlos, a representative, a representative of Puente de Amor. Uh, Carlos, are you ready? Give me some, let, let me give him some time in case uh, he's having issues with his mic. Uh, does anybody see him on? Because I can only see so many people on my screen. Does anybody see Carlos on? He's not on the list of Mem people. Memot. Okay. Memot. So at this point, then, we're going to just open the floor to discussion. Oh, he's um, sick. Okay, but he can't hear you, so maybe well, he can Try again. No, I said I don't need to hear me on the list. Mamoy, can you hear me? So we're going to open the floor to Mamoy? the discussion at this point. Mamoy? And, and listen, everybody, I want to be very clear. We have a hard stop at 5 p.m. at 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, I'm Mamoy, this is Cheryl. Um, yes, Cheryl. Car Carlos Lazo contacted us last night and said that he's been ill. And he's very sorry that he couldn't participate today. So, um, okay. <coughs> okay. Thank you, Cheryl, for the update. Appreciate it. Um, and obviously, we hope uh, Carlos gets better soon. Uh, so we will we will open the floor up to discussion. If folks have questions, this is the time. Um, and also, like I said, we have a hard stop, 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Uh, Pacific. So I want to let you all know in advance. You know, People don't need this discussion saying that I'm about to be rude. I'm telling everybody to act. Uh, and if 
maybe one of the co-chairs there, you all can uh, give me the order because I can't see that as well. The order is Mary, Pete, and Nesbitt, and there are also a couple questions in the chat. Okay, let's start off with Mary, then Pete, then Nesbitt. And, and then Mamut, can you hear me? Thank you, Sequoia. And Natasha, <laughs> and Ambassador Yuri. <clears throat> and my only question is, can we get a sheet of talking points? We're going to present this in Cambridge again, and also in at least one town in Western Mass. And to get something like a distillation of the points that Ambassador Yuri made would be great, because taking that to uh, a city councilor immediately educates them. Is it possible to get that? Yes. We'll turn up those points. Yeah, we were just talking, we're, I was taking notes, we'll make sure we get from the ambassador and from our friends at the mission, bullet points that we can share with everybody about the, uh, the list. Yeah, that's also a high priority for a setting. For a setting, yeah. yeah. Mamut, if, can you hear me? Yeah, I just wanted you, you to know that in addition to the queue you have online, there's about four or five people in the room here when you're ready that also want to be added to the, uh, the queue. Okay, so let me get through uh, Dylan. We're going to have Pete, then Nesbitt, then Dylan, and then we'll, we'll get to the room. Okay. Uh, Pete, you have the floor. Thank, thank you, and hello, everybody from uh, Miami. Um, I'm struck in the discussion on the terrorism list how so far it's been discussed as a matter of legislation and policy um, with nuances between different political parties and so forth. But I think it's also important to remember uh, some of the things that the ambassador said, that, that this terrorist list designation is part of a 62-year war economic, social, political war of the United States against the Cuban Revolution. And there are very big stakes for Washington that go beyond particularities of legislation. There are stakes of the impact that Cuba has on all of Latin American politics, which is a looming storm, I think we could say in some ways, uh, for the United States right now. Um, and the example of social progress within Cuba despite the blockade that is a very inspiring thing to people in the United States and around the world. So it's not just something we can legislate because it's not something that comes from a democratic impulse on the part of the U.S. government. It's part of a, uh, a long-standing counter-revolutionary policy that it has. Um, and I think that when they use the term terrorism, to describe Cuba, in many ways it's a sign of weakness. That they can't, uh, the real issues that are posed by uh, what the government and people of Cuba are doing. Um, so they try and scare people with phrases about communism, about terrorism, uh, instead of addressing real issues. And I think this is very important for our movement, because I want to give an example from a very important poll that is conducted every year by Florida International University on um, the thinking of the more than Cubans who live in Miami Dade County. Um, if, in this poll, um, if you, when they ask people do they favor or oppose the blockade, the figure is 63% this year uh, favor the blockade and 37% oppose it, which we should keep in mind, 37% opposing it is 370,000 people in Miami. Um, but when they get into the particulars of the effect of the blockade, for example, should the U.S. sell food to Cuba? 64% yes, 36% no. Should they sell medicine to Cuba? 72% yes, oppose 27%. Should there be visas issued out of the embassy? 82% yes, 17 against. Family unification, 92 yes, 7 opposed. Remittances is split, 47-53. Full airline service, 
this is 71, 20. what I'm trying to say here is that when we look at Carlos Lazo's Puentes de Amor and the six demands that it raises concretely as part of opposing the U.S. blockade, the caravans, Puente de Amor, and our movement as a whole represents the voice of most people. Not only, and I think it's not only in Miami-Dade County among Cubans, but among the general population. So our challenge is to mobilize that sentiment. And we had a little measurement of where we're at during the week of actions against the UN, which Cheryl reported on. Um, I was very involved in the New York demonstration. Um, it was very important. There were new caravans for the first time in places like Jacksonville, Duluth. Uh, we have a chance to reach out and grow because on the real issues, these are things that regular working people agree with us on. So the mass action side of this national network on Cuba is very important in that regard. How do we not only orient towards the politicians, but also orient towards ourselves and put the energy which pressures the politicians into play? Because I'm sure that those who concentrate on the lobbying aspect of our movement will acknowledge that being able to say that there are these demonstrations and so forth, resolutions, are part of what makes them credible to these politicians. I mean, these politicians are calculating uh, what's good for my career. They're not calculating what's good for Cuba or the US. So um, in that regard, I just wanted to expand briefly on the point Cheryl also made about the idea of a March conference. I think it's very important that we all get together beyond the number of people in this grouping um, to educate ourselves, inspire ourselves, and organize ourselves to fold into the mixture of what we're all doing. Uh, mass actions, monthly caravans. Uh, I'm proud to say Miami has had its 29th consecutive monthly caravan will take place December 4th. We're a little skipping over the Thanksgiving last Sunday of the month. And that's also because Art Basel, Miami, will take place that week. Last year, 83,000 people came to Miami Beach to be part of that. And our caravan this year is going to be driving through there to bring our message to a worldwide audience. So uh, I just want to urge people to put that on their radar, that an organizing conference to educate and mobilize the base we can so we can grow it. And I think we really do speak for a big majority of people, and the challenge is to show it. Thank you very much. I thank you, Pete. Now, we have a few more folks um, uh, here online, and then we're going to go to, uh, to the actual room. But I do ask people to be, be mindful that uh, there are several people who want to speak, and we have about 18 minutes left. So moving forward, please um, be respectful of time and make your statement uh, as brief as possible. Uh, next person to speak will be Nesbitt and then Dylan, and then we're going to go to the room. So Nesbitt, you have the floor. I would like to address both what Natasha spoke about <clears throat> and what Rita spoke about in reference to resolutions and in reference to being uh, a SERI being our legislative contact. Um, I think that as successful as we were last year, we must increase our, our successful communications uh, fivefold when it comes to removing Cuba off of the international list of terrorists. I think that um, I think that from a macro standpoint, every person, every member organization on this call should be connected in some way or another, advisory board or um, a tertiary advisory board to a SERI. Should be connected to a SERI so that a SERI has that type of communication with every one of us. Uh, from, a, from a micro standpoint, Every area in the country that deals with Cuba in some type of really substantial way should have some type of contact, communications, training, legislative um, discussion with the SERI, um, especially uh, in southern Florida, around, uh, um, around the various borders, 
where, and, and also those uh, areas such as Oakland, where Barbara Lee is going to be um, becoming one of the main people dealing with Cuba from a legislative standpoint. We must connect ourselves much more closely to a setting, be more effective, so it's not something that just we as a choir knows about, but the entire community, the, the, the American community knows about uh, our trying to remove Cuba from this list. Thank you. Thank you, Nesbitt. Uh, appreciate, appreciate your comments and keeping it brief. Appreciate it, Nesbitt. Um, Dylan, you have the floor, and then we're going to go to the room. Thank you so much. Um, so with, with our organization, we have lots of clubs around the country that are very new um, to this work. And uh, I wonder how we can, as an organization, not in NCC, but my organization specifically can help our affiliates around the country pass these resolutions in their community. Um, and Mary had a really good uh, question about the talking point sheet. But I was wondering if we could also, in addition to the talking point sheet and the awesome resolution document that was provided, um, maybe get a full toolkit with a step-by-step -step guide of how to actually move this resolution and promote it in community, pass it through city council, uh, and even some pre-made social graphics that could be provided in a toolkit that we could use to promote the resolution online and build that grassroots digital strategy that uh, Natasha highlighted earlier. Um, for our organization, I think this would help uh, us empower our members and our growing membership with the tools they need to do this. Um, and so that is all I want to say. And I thank you guys so much for giving me the time. Dylan, thank you. Um, you. You'll be happy to know that a lot of that information is So please email. Um, she, she, uh, she put out the, uh, the email for Marky. Please reach out to them and they'll, they'll uh, collaborate with you. Uh, and now to the uh, in the room. So, uh, Gail, if you can, if you can um, leave this portion because I can't see everybody in the room. Okay. Yeah. So um, we'll start out with Marla. Yeah. I think one of the uh, well, Yuri said there are many implications for uh, the terrorists. <coughs> they're, they're asking. I guess just <coughs> to project. Well, speak right? up. Yeah. Okay. Okay. One of them that I think we can make some progress on if we speak out is uh, the, the change in the ESTA program, which is the electronic system for travel authorization. This change, because of the Terrorist Act, makes it very difficult for anybody who's traveled to Cuba to come to the United States. And this is a blow not only to those who want to come to Cuba and then to the United States, but it's a blow to us and our ability to interact with people around the world. So I think when we have our caravans, when we have our street actions, when we're speaking on panels, uh, or we have speaking engagements, we should hammer away at this point also. Thank you. Thanks. Just a point of information, both videos that we're going to make sure everybody gets and we're going to show deal specifically with that uh, very important point. Good. So, Dan and then Ike. Well, thank you, Ambassador Yuri, for your very informative uh, outline of the real history of who's the real terrorist and who's the victim of terrorism. The United States has had a totally consistent policy towards Cuba ever since the 1959 revolution. And it's spelled out in documents in the early years of the, after the revolution. The United States is trying to punish Cuba. They're trying to starve Cuba. They're trying to make life as difficult as possible, hoping to uh, get dissatisfaction from the people of Cuba to overthrow their, their revolutionary socialist government. Um, and don't forget the Cuban Five. Cuban Five were victimized and spent 16 plus years in prison for opposing violence coming from the United States attacking Cubans. Cuba is, in a way, Cuba is a threat to the U.S. government. Certainly not a military threat, but they're a threat from their example. Their example that uh, the ordinary wor uh, workers and peasants, ordinary farmers, can make a revolution, can make a socialist revolution. And it's an example for the world that revolution is possible. You know, that's, this is terrifying to the United States government. That's why they have their aggressive stand against Cuba and have tried for, uh, for what is it, 13, 14 presidents now, all consistently trying to overthrow the Cuban government through their uh, efforts to have a tighter and tighter uh, economic war against Cuba and make things difficult for Cuba. So n there's no better time for us to escalate our efforts 
to end the embargo and to end the uh, getting on the uh, removing from the list of terrorist organizations. Thanks, Dan. Um, I okay. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to just take up this whole question uh, in several meetings, which had some of our solidarity folks at them with people from the State Department. They've tried to project this uh, line that it's not a priority for them to take Cuba off the uh, terrorism list, even though they may say, oh, certainly they shouldn't be there, blah, blah, blah. But actually, that's such pure, distilled BS, uh, because really they do have a priority, as we all know. Their priority is regime change to overthrow the Cuban government. So this is just pure uh, sophistry. But I want to, uh, I'm glad to see that we're all trying to figure out how we can best deal with this. And we have a lot of tools at our disposure, uh, disposal, including videos, Cuban Five stuff, Saul Landau's great video, Who is the Real Terrorist, some of the history that uh, the ambassador started to give us, which is quite uh, enthralling. And I think this will be a very central part of the spring uh, 2023 conference that is starting to get uh, rolling. And I really want to thank uh, the NNLC for the support uh, expressed in Cheryl's report uh, for this. This can be a real opportunity for us to highlight, along with the other uh, two main demands, that's one of the main demands, the whole question of terrorism, to discuss that in different forums, uh, formats, the, the, the list and, and all of that. So, and all the different areas of work that our United Movement is involved in. They're trying to throw uh, dust in our eyes, and actually, we have a lot of momentum on our side now to sort of fight around these issues and highlight them in a way that we haven't uh, been able to do really the openings in the past. Uh, for example, the vote at the UN, a, tr a lot of momentum coming out of that, the further isolation of the US, the uh, election in Brazil, the election in Colombia, the developments in Latin America, the isolation of the U.S. All of these things mean that this is the most, uh, I think I'm using the word right, propitious time for us to actually press forward. So I think this conference coming up, which we can all work on in a united way, uh, can be an opportunity for us uh, to unite and do that and, and further this momentum and have a real material impact. Yes, yes, uh, Mama, uh, Kala, our newest co-chair. Yay! Okay. Thank you. Kala. Uh, thank you so much for the powerful speech and for the Cuban delegation for being here. Um, this is something I think everyone in this meeting understands, but I just wanted to highlight how young voters have more power than ever, and young voters' priorities are increasingly becoming politicians' priorities, and they're feeling young voters' pressures more than ever, and having new faces, dozens of new faces, in the room with politicians, I think will really make them understand you know, the importance of this issue. Uh, the first Gen Z representative in Congress was also just elected um, in Orlando, and he is Cuban-American. Um, he's critical of the Cuban government, but he condemns the blockade and um, is, is pushing for an end to the blockade, or at least he was during this campaign. So I'm also really interested to see where that goes, and I think we should all be, you know, on the lookout and um, especially, you know, like using young people to pressure more younger politicians like this person who was just elected. Okay, thank you, Kai. Um, maybe, can you do me a favor, brother, and mute is just bouncing off your, uh, your uh, mic there. Thank you, brother. Uh, is there anyone else uh, in the room who wants to speak? I, I want, if I can, just say something. Um, I think that this is a great opportunity for us to really be exploring really concrete, specific things that we can, uh, we can each do. Uh, some will do bigger things, some will do smaller, you know, but it's all, all of it is important. Every last piece of initiative I think we can agree is important. I think what would be really, what I want to propose is that we have at least, I don't know, something, Angie help me, a Google Doc, some place where we are throwing out ideas collectively because we're not going to have enough time to do it all here. 
but this is our best bet for like getting you know um, uh, our, our thoughts on paper so that we can look at specific stuff that we can actually be doing as we take on this really awesome but an incredibly important task um, as we move forward. We all know the importance of it, but I just want to make sure we, we're finding a way to, um, you know, collect our ideas so that we're, 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 we're continuing after this meeting. So, actually. And we want this to go large. Can I have a pause? Like two minutes? Oh, well, Laura, you have to wait on a few people uh, before you uh, I'll give you the floor after, after the last person. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, we have uh, Sharon, Sharon, uh, Cheryl here, uh, who wants to say something. Okay, uh, so we got Cheryl, and then after Cheryl, we'll be going to uh, Eric, then Diana, then Gary, then Marky, and then Omar. Oh boy. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, Great. It, it occurs to me that, you know, like the cube, when we were fighting to free the Cuban Five, we had something to mobilize around that was concrete. Uh, that everybody in their own way could plug into. And the, the state sponsors of terrorism and the blockade against Cuba not only affects and hurts Cuba primarily, but it also hurts us. I mean, could we as residents of the United States take a complaint to the United Nations for the violation of our rights to have, you know, to be able to have uh, an exchange with Cuba in a, in a meaningful and humanitarian way. It's just one thought. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Cheryl. Uh, now we're going to move on to Eric. Eric, you have the floor. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, stress, I think as we are discussing this, Cheryl, that's a great idea. But education is essential in this fight. And education, not just to politicians, but to regular you know, American citizens who, because of the mass media boycott on anything real or honest about Cuba, many people know nothing about the realities of Cuba, what it can offer American citizens, which I know here we're speaking to the choir. But this is the kind of information that needs to get out. This spring conference that we're talking about is a wonderful sounding board for that. The street actions are a necessity in order to get the visual, visual um, presence that we need to bring in new people. But you're right, Cheryl, we can definitely attach it to why our rights as American citizens are being violated, why Cuban Americans living here. There was a wonderful piece in the belly of the beast um, short documentary little um, video that they did of the street action on October 29th of one of the people that came up from Miami that said, why, why can't I, as an American citizen, give money to my father who lives in Cuba? This is a violation of my right. So I think, yes, we need to have that. But the best idea is a four-tier approach which pushes legislation on a local you know, level, congressional level, street actions, as well as this spring conference, which can bring in international, national, which can bring in all of that stuff, as well as educate. All right, thank you, Eric. And then Diana, Gary, Marcy, and then Omari. Now keep in mind, everybody, we're at 158. Um, I did get the green light to expand a little bit, but that time is gonna be uh, geared towards Ambassador Yuri. If there's any questions for Ambassador Yuri Gala, uh, so please um, make this these, these, these next few sentences be possible. Uh, Diana, you have the floor. Um, thank you, and thank you all for such a thoughtful and important presentations that have been uh, going on. Um, I mainly said it in the chat. I don't. I feel like, um, but one question was uh, whether the focus of the resolutions is. <coughs> really um, municipalities and councils. I feel like it really has um, potential if we expand it to a lot of to groups taking on these resolutions and uh, you know unions, state-based organizations. So that was one point and then the other one I just that I can add to the Google Doc is 
considering like we used to do the five days for the five, doing you know national mobilization in DC where people combine you know grassroots and lobbying. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Omari and Gary, uh, well, Gary, you can unmute, but Omari, I'm going to be you. Uh, it's bouncing off your uh, your mic there. Uh, Gary, you have the floor. Yes, sir. Uh, at the end of the meeting in Minneapolis uh, uh, five years ago, we made a commitment to do uh, resolutions at the state, local uh, level. Uh, that much came of it until the pandemic happened. And we created a local resolution subcommittee within Saving Lives. And the incredible success that we have had in getting you around the country to take this as a priority and to have 44 million Americans now represented by our resolutions has been a huge step forward. And so now going forward, this local resolution subcommittee should become a key place of organizing for our entire movement, as much as the U.S. Cuba normalization meetings are, because we're going to be spearheading the work that has been decided to focus on resolutions on terrorism. We have a couple of huge prizes in front of us that are winnable, Los Angeles and New York City, just to name two, and there are many others. So um, please focus on that. Um, all you need to do if you're listening to this into this call is to send the email to Marcy Shapiro. Our committee's going to follow up. We have a meeting within the next two weeks. We're going to follow up with everybody. I've heard a number of new cities, including Washington, D.C., uh, come forward in the call. Uh, and we would also urge you, as individuals, as activists, to consider taking 90 minutes out of your every three weeks to be part of strategy meetings with us on a national basis on the question of expanding this campaign. So that's where we're at. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Marcy and then Omari, and then my middle brother, I see your hand raised, so I'll, I'll get to you okay. after uh, Omari. Thank okay? you. And then we're going to open the floor to questions for our ambassador, Yuri Stalin. Uh, so, Marcy, you have the floor. Can everyone else okay. please mute? Okay, I put the information in the chat, so I don't have much to say except to answer the one question that. There are unions, there are nonprofit organizations, there are associations, there are states, and there are municipalities that have all um, had resolutions. So it's a broad group of, of uh, people. That's all. I have to say. Okay. Thank you, Martin. And now, uh, Omar, you have the floor, and. Uh I, I see your camera is a little frozen. Can you hear me, Omar? Yeah, I hear you well. Okay, you have the floor. Yeah, I wanted to raise something that I think is very important for uh, all of us coast to coast and around the world, and that is uh, an example of the uh, Puerto Rican Cuba solidarity activists in opposing what the FBI was doing. You know, they're trying to clean up the uh, image of the FBI, uh, but that should be a part of our arsenal. Remember, we fought uh, to get freedom for the Cuba Five, and who were some of the main advocates that actually organized the raid on the Cuba Five and kept track of them. So I think part of our uh, uh, education, if you will, should be to point out the danger of the FBI trying to intimidate activists in the uh, Cuba Solidarity Movement and that we have under no compulsion whatsoever and even opening the door to the FBI, we should move on. I think we should, I wasn't able to come to the meeting in New York, but I think uh, the fight that the uh, Puerto Rican Congress did is exemplary, and we need to, and that of the uh, African People's Socialist Party as well. And we need to educate people about the fact that the FBI, the mother around, being nice to some and not so nice to others, trying to intimidate those of us who are fighting the end the U.S. war against Cuba. So that should be a part of our educational process that we talk to people about. Okay, thank you, Omar. And now we're going to have Yamil, and then we're going to open the floor for questions for Ambassador Yori Yellen. So, Yamil, you're on the floor, brother. 
Oh, okay, my brother. Thank you for the opportunity again. Uh, and what I'm going to uh, say is, is very much linked with what Sharif and uh, Omar was explaining. I'm going to put the, the Q on side of the coin. Plenty of you know about uh, how the blockade and how this being in the list of countries sponsoring terrorism affects Cuba. But I would like to also to recommend and suggest that also in those resolutions that uh, we are planning to approve, they have the other component of how they block it and how being in this list affect the U.S. people. You know, there is a number of biotechnological products that we in Cuba produced that the regular people in the United States uh, cannot access. You know, we're talking about ever drug peak. Uh, we're talking about the long vaccine, for, uh, the, the, the vaccine for lung cancer. And there's a number of biotechnological products that we produce in Cuba that, you know, there is a, 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 a serious problems in the United States with diabetes. And uh, by some numbers I've been reading, around 100, 100,000 amputations per year take place because of that, you know, because of diabetes. Can you imagine how many people, if 80% of those limbs that are amputated in the United States could be saved, 80%, we're talking about 80,000 amputations prevented per year, that also part of how the blockade impacts the United States people, not only Cuba, but also the United States people. And that is something that we need to bear in mind, that is something that needs to be addressed and people need, needs to be educated on. Thank you very much for the opportunity. All right, thank you, Brother Diomio. Uh, now we're going to open the floor to a few, uh, for a few questions. Listen, at, at this point, I think we can probably get two questions. So, if anyone has any specific questions to Ambassador uh, Yuri? Um, uh, it's Gail again. Can I? Can I Go just? Ahead. I apologize. Grab the floor real quickly. I meant to do something earlier. Um, many of us know that we lost recently a compañero, Frank Melgar, who was very instrumental in formulating the National Network on Cuba. And we've been remiss in not lifting up Frankie uh, at this meeting. Um, many of us here in the New York area were blessed to be able to work with Frankie. Um, he's somebody who was known nationally, internationally. He, there was a beautiful memorial service for him that many of us attended uh, just a few weeks ago. And I just, it would, it would be remiss in not taking this moment to just say Frank Belgara, Presente. There's so much that we can say about Frank. Even just talking about him a little bit is, is very emotional because he was just such a, a mainstay uh, in, in our community. Um, ben. Ramos, there is going to be a memorial for Frank here in uh, New York. Can you just... Yes. Uh, a lot of us in Frankie's family and Pro Liberta and a lot of the other organizations that Frankie created, helped found, and worked with have come together to form a committee. On Saturday, February 4th at Holyrood Church, uh, Reverend Luis Barrios' okay. church in Washington Heights, we're doing a tribute to his political legacy and his history of struggle. Uh, it's going to be also, it's going to be a hybrid activity. We're going to have individuals from Puerto Rico on Zoom as well as live, and it'll be live streamed from Holy Roots YouTube channel and I believe their Facebook channel. So those folks who are outside of New York City will be able to attend virtually. Excellent. We'll be sure to, to, to share uh, the news of that uh, once we, we know more. So thank you for just giving a moment. He had meant to do that earlier and didn't want the uh, afternoon session to end without lifting up our, our, our brother Frank. So, and now um, to continue on with what um, we pass the floor to the ambassador. Yes, thank you. Uh, ambassador Yuri, you, you have the, uh, you have the floor. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned that perhaps there might be some questions that I could address. 
there's any question from the audience, I'll be ready yeah. to, to comment on that. Sounds good. Is, it, is there any questions? Are there any questions from, uh, from anyone here at this meeting? Yes. We have we have time for about two meetings. I mean, two questions. Uh, uh, there's a there's a there's a, uh, Angel is in the room and uh, uh, just a quick question. I I've heard that the that the, the U.S. is going to Cuba to talk about the uh, I guess the folks who are leaving Cuba coming here. Is there any room for you know any kind of counter proposal? I don't know what that discussion is going to be about. But well. Uh, what I've what I heard about that visit, uh, there are some news out there saying that a high official from the State Department went down to Cuba uh, as part of a trip to a number of countries in the region. And I believe that is related to the implementation of the uh, migration accord uh, when it comes to Cuba. I think that is uh, the person um, was or is actually um, uh, a deputy assistant secretary or assistant secretary of state for consular affairs. <coughs> so, if it is that visit, I think is again related to the implementation of the uh, migration record, uh, agreements. Um, it has to be said that obviously Cuba and the United States have had a number of migration accords, um, and the one that is uh, more uh, relevant now. Um, is basically um, reiterating the previous commitments. Uh, one of the commitments, for example, from the U.S. government is to uh, allow the legal, um, I would say, the legal migration uh, from Cuba to the United States of at least 20,000 Cubans on a yearly basis. So that is one of the uh, components of the agreements uh, that unfortunately during the Trump administration at some point were uh, not um, uh, complied with and, and therefore was one of the factors as to why uh, there has been an increase in the flow of Cubans uh, towards the United States. Uh, that was only one of the factors, but obviously, uh, to my perspective, the main factor continues to be the blockade against Cuba, which actually is, uh, you know, uh, directing or trying to uh, suffocate the Cuban economy and to create a situation in Cuba whereby people would have to leave. So that's basically what the blockade is all about. Um, but complementing that, there are a number of other factors that would be, uh, would actually encourage illegal migration or irregular migration to the United States. So that's, I think that's the visit you're talking about, uh, or at least the one that I'm aware of. So there's no way of, of trying to uh, use that visit uh, and speak about what we've been talking about today. Well, uh, we let me tell you, uh, the Cuban government has been very uh, transparent in saying that we're ready to discuss with the United States government the issues related to the bilateral relationship. Um, if we are having a, a respectful dialogue, uh, a mutually uh, a respectful dialogue, and from our side, the willingness is there. Um, but we need two people to actually do the dialogue. Do that. So <laughs> we are ready from our side. Uh, it has been said by our president, by our foreign minister, uh, high officials, officials from the Cuban government, that Cuba has always been ready to discuss uh, those issues of our, of our bilateral agenda. With the understanding, again, and that is very important, because uh, there might be some other ideas, but from our side, there has to be a respect to the independence of Cuba, to the sovereignty of Cuba. And with that in mind, we're ready to, to sit and, and have a dialogue. Thank you. On a reciprocal basis, obviously. Okay. Any other comments, questions? In the room? Yeah, we have one. We have two, but Pete. Since Greg never spoke yet, and you spoke a couple of times, and we only have one, one, one space, we're going to give the space to Greg. Hey, Pete. Of course. Or Greg, you have the floor. Now, 
Um, yeah, I would like to ask the ambassador if um, diplomats from the United Nations can visit states outside of New York. Interesting, <laughs> okay. Interesting question. Well, let, me, let me address that with the following. Just, just this week, uh, we had uh, another discussion on basically is the report of the uh, host country committee. Uh, that is the committee uh, that I've mentioned is, is actually dealing with the responsibility of the host country of the United Nations, namely the United States. So the United States is the host country of the organization and this committee deals with uh, you know, the issues that has been mentioned by delegations as it relates to the responsibility and, and obligations uh, by the United States government um, when it comes to um, executing the relevant agreements on that. And there has been for many years a lot of concerns expressed at that committee uh, because of the uh, non-compliance by the U.S. Uh, on certain issues. For example, the issuance of <coughs> visas on a timely basis or issues related to um, a restriction of movements uh, for, for certain diplomats. Um, and for example, in the case of Cuba and um, other nations here, uh, permanent missions to the United Nations, we have had over the years uh, a restriction of movement. Uh, at some point, we were on the area of 25 miles uh, ratio. But now, it has to be said that Cuba, the Cuban mission is perhaps the one that is under the more strictest restriction uh, applied at this point. And that means that, for example, uh, the Cuban diplomats, and not only the Cuban diplomats at the permanent mission, but also officials visiting New York City for meetings at the United Nations. Uh, there is a restriction that uh, we cannot go beyond uh, to the north, the street 178, I think, and from the south, the limit will be Battery Park, and from the respective uh, east and west, it will be the river, you know, the river, yeah. Yeah. the border, uh, the boundaries of that. Yeah. So if you have to go beyond that, there, there is a protocol uh, for that, which is basically to request a permission to go outside those boundaries. And do, as I said, it is a, uh, a, proceeding, a, a procedure uh, that uh, you have to apply for that with certain days in advance, and you have to fill out a form with certain data that you have to include on that. So that is basically something that we have been uh, mentioning in those meetings and not only the Cuban delegation but other delegations as well that yeah. are subject to not uh, identical restrictions but similar restrictions uh, for many years as well. So that's what I can say about that. Can, can I just insert that the, uh, the memorial uh, bin at uh, Holyrood mm -hmm. is a case in point, right? It's on yeah. one set one <laughs> block. <laughs> that, that means that the, that the ambassador and our colleagues, if they wanted to attend that memorial, would have to get special permission. Right. Yes. That's how yeah. crazy. They, they were unable to go to the memorial days after Frankie died That's because right. it was on 184th. No, That's uh, outside the, the boundaries of that. Example. Sometimes you get the permission, sometimes you may not get the permission. And they can't stop Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for, uh, for our special guest, Ambassador Yuri Gala, and then also everyone who presented today, and all the folks who asked questions and, and gave response. We really appreciate everyone. We're going to move on. Uh, to the next portion of our our, uh, our session here on Saturday, second session. Uh, and this is going to be a workshop on propaganda and social media, uh, led by Professor Alberti and then uh, Ashley. So, um, uh, Professor Alberti, are you ready? Uh, remote, he isn't able yeah, to get communication. Right, go ahead, Sharon. 
Yeah, he's, um, we've been trying to get him connected. We haven't been able to do that yet. Okay. So we'll lead off with Angie, uh, and then if, if he's able to get in, we'll see him in after Angie's completed. Uh, Angie, are you ready to present? Yes. That's great. Thank you. Okay. All right. I am ready. Come on over, Angie. Come on over. All right. All right. Yeah. Once again, uh, applause. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Good to see you. Thank you. With love from upstate. Thank you. 